simple. Make it simple for guys in the field. Thanks, Keith. I would have forgot. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, let's get going here. There we go. Um, list of service guys. These are um, guys at the Larson Company that um, are available to help you if you guys are having tech issues in the field. And if you look at the bottom, we have a service number of 800-827-9508. And that will get you into the service department. Camera's working here, so. All right, for some reason my phone wasn't working here, but I guess we're okay. Um, but anyway, uh, if, if you need to get hold of any of our service guys, uh, these are the guys that are available. Um, just about every one of us covers Mitsubishi. Um, most of us cover train in American Standard. Uh, we got Scott or Scott Chris all himself out in Indianapolis with Reem. Um, but other than that, if you call the 800-827-9508 uh, and hit option two and leave a message, somebody will call you back pretty quick. So um, otherwise, there's our individual numbers also. And if anybody wants a copy of this presentation or this PDF, um, shoot me an email after class or shoot me a message. And I'll make sure I send that out to you or leave a message in chat. And I'll make sure I get it to you if you leave me your email address. Um, another thing I wanted to point out, and I know that uh, we've got people that are not trained or not American Standard. Um, pretty much what we're going to cover today, um, it, it covers ECM Motors for probably 95% of, of the product out there. Um, you know, whether it's a York or a Lennox or a Ream or or whatever, the, the, the basics are the same. So you, you should be able to take away, you know, a pretty good idea of how to troubleshoot motors and how they work when you're done today. Uh, one of the things that we have for training American Standard is the fieldtechhelp.com website. And it's not password protected. It's available to anybody who wants to use it. So just type in fieldtechhelp.com. Um, there's some videos I'm going to play today that come directly out of this website. So this is available to all you guys. There's no trade secrets here. Um, you know, feel free to go out there and use it for training purposes. The videos are kind of neat. Um, Eric Weiss does them and they're usually six, eight, 10 minute videos. So they're, they're pretty short and to the point. Um, but again, it's available. So don't hesitate to use it. For the train and American Standard guys, there's also something called Train 360 or American Standard 360. It's a phone app, um, which allows you access to all of our technical literature. Um, check with your sales guy or your team group and they can get you pointed in the right direction on this. But uh, it's a good thing to have on your phone or your, your tablets when you're in the field nights and weekends and you can't access information. And I'll give you one of my trade secret, secrets. It's called Google. Um, Google can find a lot of stuff for you when you're kind of stuck by yourself. So um, with that, we're going to get started on the motors. Um, I get a lot of calls where, you know, everybody says DC motors, direct current motors. And that's the DC doesn't stand for direct current. The DC stands for digitally commutated motors. OK, so that's where the DC comes from. And all of these motors are digitally commutated, whether it be an ECM or, or a CTM motor. Um, CTM is a constant torque or more commonly refer, referred to as an X13 motor. Um, the principles are, are kind of the same between them, but they're, they're controlled a little bit differently and they have different capabilities, which, you know, again, we're gonna cover that this afternoon and, um, and you know, answer any questions we, that come up on that also. Um, again, variable speed motor operation and troubleshooting. And this is just kind of a, a cutaway of, of an ECM motor. Um, I put it up there because it's got, you know, the electronics are in the module on the end of the motor. Um, we've got usually two inputs. We've got a high voltage input. We've got a low voltage input. Um, the high voltage is there all the time, um, whether this be a 110 volt or a 220 volt motor. And then it's controlled by the low voltage inputs. This happens to be a 16 pin connector, um, which is pretty common for probably the last 20 years, 25 years. This is what we've been used in, using in the field. And 
Again, this motor applies to a ton of different manufacturers. So what you take away from this motor will cover an awful lot of manufacturers in the field. Um, and then we'll touch, of course, on the new stuff, the four pin communicating motors also. Um, and, and they're fairly similar, but there are some subtle differences between manufacturers on that. So, and again, we'll go over that stuff too. So what's an ECM motor? Okay, so this is just a, a an animation of an ECM motor. And basically what it does is we send a signal through the windings and it determines the speed of the motor, determines the rotation of the motor. And that's all done through the programming, either on the, the board with the personality module or through the module itself, depending on, again, on manufacturer. But ECM is electrically commutated motor. It's a constant airflow motor. So in, in, in other words, this motor will maintain airflow at all different static pressures up to a, a given point. Whereas a CTM motor, which is a constant torque motor, and, and all, again, also referred to as an X13 motor, um, it gives you constant torque on the shaft, but your airflow will tend to decrease as the static pressure increases. And I've got some blower charts. We'll take a look at that in a little bit to, to explain how that works. But basically what we're doing is we have a, a magnetized uh, rotor in here and we send electrical current through the windings at different speeds and different cycles to change the speed of that motor based on the input from the module. And I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on the input of the module, but on a constant torque motor, it's based on torque. So whatever torque the shaft is looking at, we get what's called counter EMF or, you know, see, you know, uh, back into the motor windings. And that will tell us what the static and what the, the torque is on the shaft and the, the electronics react to that, that number. So this is basically what we're doing with a, uh, you know, an electronically commutated motor is changing the hertz and the speed uh, at which we send electricity through the windings. All right, so some of the characteristics on a, um, a variable speed motor, and this I took this out of our, our trained American standard product line. This is our S9V for variable furnace. And if you look at it in a heating mode, um, first aid heating, at a half inch of static, we're gonna be looking at 814 CFM. Um, we've got a temperature rise of about 43 um, degrees and we're burning about 135 watts of energy to do that, okay? Just bear with me here a second. Okay, there we go. Um, so, so that's that's basically at a half inch of static on first stage. So if we go to a half inch of static on second stage, factory set, and, and we've got the choice of low, medium, low, medium, or high speed on these. Um, at a half inch of static, we're going to burn, uh, we're going to move 1,024 CFM. We're going to have about a 53 degree temp rise, and we're going to use 260 watts of power. So what happens as the static pressure increases, and this is a true ECM motor, you know, electrically commutated motor, is that as our static goes up, now we go to a 0.7, I'm still maintaining that same airflow. My temp rise is fairly stable, but my power consumption starts to go up. So now I go from 260 to 310. Okay, if I go to a 0.9 static, um, the airflow is gonna stay the same. St uh, temp rise should stay the same. And my static is, or my power consumption is gonna increase to 360. So on an ECM motor, as you increase static on the system, you're gonna increase power consumption. The airflow is gonna remain the same. Temp rise should remain the same, but your power consumption goes up. And if you look at this, um, we're using about hundred watts more, which is about probably about 30, 40% more power at this higher static condition. Okay, so that that's the basic characteristic of a variable speed motor. As the airflow, as the static goes up, the airflow maintains, but the power consumption goes up along with that. Um, if you look at this, this um, on our, our particular motors, this is a cooling, um, you know, our cooling speed. Because it's an ECM motor, we can choose. We can program in different parameters. 
Um, we can go anywhere from 290 CFM per ton to 450 CFM per ton. Um, if, if you guys are getting into AHRI standards these days, you'll see that we're, we're not running at 400 CFM per ton in most cases. Um, in most cases, you're at that 350 to 370, unless you're living in the mountains or out west where there's no humidity, um, then you might be at that 420 to 450. You know, you need, you need more airflow when you have less humidity to deal with in, the, in, the, uh, in those cases. So bear with me here a sec. Okay. Um, but again, if you look at the cooling side, if we say we'll just pick 400 CFM per ton on a two ton system and a half inch of static, I'm going to 800 CFM and I'm going to burn 153 watts of power to do that. At a 0.7, I'm still going to move 800, but it's, I'm going to start using 200 watts of power. Um, at a 0.9, I'm going to still have 800 CFM. But again, I'm using probably another 25, 30% more power. It went to 253 watts. So the characteristic of an ECM motor is that as the static pressure increases, the airflow is going to try to maintain, the blower motor is going to try to overcome this. And you, you guys have probably all heard that, you know, you put this ECM motor in someone's house and all of a sudden all these areas that never heated or cooled before are working great. And that's just the characteristic of that motor that has the ability to, to try to overcome that static. But again, there is a cost to that, okay? And the cost is we're gonna use some more power. All right, so when we get into troubleshooting these, and, and that's really kind of what we're looking at is how to troubleshoot these, how do they work? Um, we've got some, some ways to do that. We've got this tech inspect tool that you can plug in. It's a go, no go. Um, typically when you, um, when you test an ECM motor or a CTM motor, for the, it either works or it doesn't. Um, if one, it's not like a, a PSC motor where one speed goes out. Um, these motors will either work or they won't work. And this go, no go tool is really a, a quick way to tell you you know, whether or not you got a good motor or a bad motor. And it always comes back to, if the motor runs, it's probably the board not giving the right signal. If the motor doesn't run, it's probably the motor and the board's fine. So um, it, it gives you an idea of what you're looking at. We've also got something called a Zebra test kit. Um, it's a little more in-depth kit. Uh, it's available. I don't have pricing on this. If you're interested, you can contact your local office and, and they can get that for you. Um, but that's another kit that's available for testing these. And, you know, in this day and age with all of the, the ECM and CTM motors we've got in the field, I, I would carry some kind of tester on my truck just to, you know, make sure I could do a quick, easy test. If you want something really economic, um, you can buy this 16 pin motor kit. And basically what it is, is you take, let me see, I think it's, yeah, it, it's basically what it does is it puts power on common to pin one and two, or excuse me, one and three, and 24 volts hot to pins 12 and 15. If the motor runs, it's good, okay? And that's basically what this test kit does. You could probably build your own. Um, if you pull out an ECM motor furnace and you pull one of these out of there, just cut the ends off and wire it according to this, and you've got your own tester. You've just made your own tester, so. Again, there are simple ways to test this, um, and that's a good way to do it. The other thing this points out is that if you are testing with a voltmeter, um, you should have 24 volts common on pin one and three. And if you give it a call for fan or a G signal, you should have 24 volts on pin 12 and about 15 volts on pin 15. So again, that, that's another way for you to, to test these motors. but um, you know, again, the 16 pin are pretty simple to test, but having the test tool on your truck just kind of makes it that much easier. So, you know, in, in retrospect or, or, you know, review on this, um, this is a good tester. These are great testers. If you want to make a simple one, you can build your own or you can buy this cheap one. I think they're like eight, 10 bucks or they're not expensive. So, but I would definitely have some kind of tester on the truck. So on all these 16 pin motors, they test the same way, okay? So whether it's a York or a Lennox or, or whatever, with these 
in motors, this stuff applies to, to all brands. Um, and again, it's a real simple way for you to, to, to do some testing and, and see what these motors are doing. So now you find out that you got a bad motor. Um, the next thing you need to do is you need to take the module off the motor and you've got to test the motor itself to make sure that the motor is good. Because if you change the module and you and you actually have a bad motor, you're going to end up burning out the new motor or the new module. So in order to test the motor, what you do is you take the motor apart, unplug the, the wires going into the motor, okay? And take your ohm meter and this plug right here, there's three wires. Could be different colors. I think, oops, I think these are blue red and black in this particular case. All of these ECM motors and these CTM motors are three phase motors, okay? Um, the module converts it into a three phase power, um, electrically commutated power. And this motor is a three phase motor. It's got a permanent magnet in there, but it is definitely a three phase motor should be equal resistance. So if you go line one to two and then two to three and then one to three on here, just like any three phase motor, you should be able to get equal resistance and that's plus or minus 10%. So typically on a half horse motor, it's about five or six ohms. And I think on a one horse, it's up around 10 ohms. You know, different sizes have different ohm values, but um, they should be equal or very, very close. If you've got a five, five and a one, you got a you got a shorted winding in that motor. Okay, and at that point you condemn the motor also. Motors are pretty tough. Um, takes a lot to burn them out, but they do burn out periodically. So again, when, when you find out you have the bad module, when you've made that initial decision, the next thing you do is ohm out that motor. Um, and again, check it to ground, make sure it's not grounded. But ohm out that motor to make sure that that motor is good before you put the new module on there, okay? Um, somebody asked earlier about this little watt limiter here, the SG348. Um, those are replaceable, yes. Um, if you can, if you can get your hands on them, um, these are basically watt limiters. You can cut it out and jump it too. So if you don't have a watt limiter on your truck, you can just take two wire nuts and wire nut those those together, pull that off of there, and wire nut them together. This thing will run until you can get back with either a new module or a new part. Um, but I do caution you, if you've seen this fail, that means that this is getting warm and this, this is the watt limiter. And if that gets warm, that's usually telling you, you have an airflow issue. Either you, you've got ductwork issues, um, you've got people not changing filters, you know, when they should be. Um, for whatever reason, we're not, we're, we're running too high of a static on the system. And this, this is the sacrificial piece right here. That's going to fail. That's what it's there for. Um, rather than burning up everything in there and burning up the motor, this will fail first. So if you've seen multiple failures on this, take a look at the air side. Um, one of the things, and I'm not going to get into filters today, but I'm not a fan of the one-inch pleated filters. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen what they can do to the static on a system, but I've seen them run them up as high as a 0.45 static across the one inch pleated filter. Um, a one inch pleated filter can cause these to fail if, if everything's marginal and they're not taking care of their filters. So um, that's what it's there for. Make sure that um, we're looking at other things. We're not just replacing this piece or the module every time. So um, but that's, a, that's a giveaway. That's an airflow issue of some type. Um, just tells you your system's running hot, okay. All right, so on these, these 16 pins that we're looking at here, and again, if you guys want this publication, here's the number, shoot me a text, shoot me an email, you know, shoot me a note in chat, whatever, um, and I will send this book to you. It's about a 20 or 30 page book, but all of these pins have different meanings on here. And if you look at them, um, pin one, of course, is common and pin three is common. Uh, we referenced pin 12 before. 12 is basically a reference voltage. So when you're looking at these motors, pin 12 needs 24 volts. That just keeps the electronics alive. That's what it's there for, just to, to activate the electronics. Okay, so when I go to pin 15, 
which we said earlier, that's my constant fan call or my G call. Okay, so on these motors, when you give it a G call, that's telling it to go to 50% airflow, 50% of whatever the cooling speed is set for. Okay, as soon as I give it a Y call, um, it's going to send me to my cooling speed. Okay. Uh, if I give it a W1 call, it's going to send me to my first stage heating speed. If I give it a W2 call, it's going to send me to second stage heating speeds. All of these pins have a function um, on our boards. And I don't know about other manufacturers, but we have a CFM light on the bottom of the board. There's a green light and it flashes one flash for every hundred CFM that that blower is running. Okay. Um, this is the signal out and this is the signal back. So these two wires are relaying back and forth between the motor and the board as to what the actual CFM is of that motor, okay? BK is our dehumidification function. So when we enable BK, it drops that blower speed by 20% to do better dehumidification. So again, all of these have a meaning on here. They all are there for, for some reason. So, uh, and that's what they're, how they're laid out. Um, again, just a little bigger picture of that one. See, we got a chat here. Let me see what we got. Okay, hang on. Oh, my chat disappeared. I don't know where it went. Can you see anything in there, Keith? Or? Uh, nothing else has come in on chat. Okay, All right. It flashed there. So, oh. oh, okay. Never mind. Yeah, somebody wants a copy of this. Great. I'll send it to you. Thank you. When, when I get done, I'll send these out. So, all right, so anyway, this, again, this is just a little bigger view, but um, if you know what these pins are, it can make the job a whole lot simpler in the field. So um, this book has a lot of really good information on it. So yeah, anybody needs it, definitely let me know. Okay, so I'm going to play a little video and you gotta bear with me because sometimes these videos can be a little hard to deal, but we've, we've got a video. Again, this is off of fieldtechhelp.com. And it, it's a free, free, uh, free place to go. And this is the video from that. So, me start. I got to start share again. Share screen with. You guys got to bear with me. I talk to myself a lot when I'm working too. So. All right. Can you hear that? The 16 pin variable speed motor is very similar between our air handler and furnaces. And in fact, you're going to find that this motor will be very similar between all manufacturers that it is applied to. The specifics for us will be the programming within the module. So the module must be programmed for the exact model number unit it is being applied to. The first step in troubleshooting any variable speed motor is to ensure we have high voltage feeding the motor. So when I look at the schematic for this furnace, we can see this motor is tied into my circulate hot and my circulate neutral wires. So the first step, looking at the back of that connector to ensure I have 115 volts, if it's a furnace or if it's an air handler on those same two connectors, I wanna make sure that I have 240 volts feeding the motor. If I have voltage feeding the motor, but the motor does not run, my focus will then be on the 16 pin connector feeding the motor. Most of the individual pins of that 16 pin connector are inputs into the motor telling the motor what capacity it needs to run in. The only pin that is a feedback is pin number 16. And that is gonna be a DC pulse back to my board that controls my fan CFM LED. So when the motor is running, every time that fan CFM pulses, each pulse is a request for 100 CFM. Now that is not actual airflow, that is requested airflow, but it also provides me information that my motor is communicating back to the board and my motor does have a request to move airflow. If my motor does not run, I'm going to use that 16 pin wiring harness to test the motor and see if it runs with a G call. Now, as I look at that 16 pin connector, I can see that one of my wires is going to be blue. And that blue wire is going to be common. And that's going to be pin number one. So it's going to be a good reference point on where all my pins are going to be. Now, if I can apply common to pins one and three and apply 24 volts to pins 12, and 15, that will simulate a G call, and my fan should start up and run 50% airflow. 
Now, trying to make all these jumper wires happen can be challenging. So we do make a wire harness kit, and that kit number is 34-3403-HS. And that's just a simple wiring harness that has four wires into that mullet's connected. Common will be on one and three. The red wire will be on 12 and 15. So if I apply 24 volts to the red wire and common goes to common, that is going to simulate a G call for my motor and I should run at 50%. Now, one thing I recommend is we start doing retrofits in the field and we start pulling out units, regardless of what manufacturer it is. And if it has a 16 pin variable speed blower motor, I would recommend removing the harness, cutting off the unused wires, and you can build your own harness in the field without having to purchase one. So whether you want to purchase or whether you want to build your own is up to you, but having a quick start guide to make life easier for you when troubleshooting these motors. We also make a publication that has a much deeper dive on these motors, as well as constant torque and outdoor variable speed fan motors. And that publication is 34-3402-04. This publication can be found on our e-learning course for variable speed motors. So when you visit our learning management system and you sign up for the variable speed motor course, in the top right of that course will be a tab called resources, on the resource link, and you can download the publication. One item in the publication that talks about what each one of those pin connectors are. So we noticed one and three for common and 12 and 15 for hot is a G call. But if I add pin six, I get a Y1. If I add pin 14, I get a Y call. So I can now simulate varying calls for capacity and see how my motor is ramping up and down. But generally speaking, the motor will either work or not work. And the simple test of applying a G call to the harness We'll let you know if the motor is functional or not. All right, bear with me. We'll get back here to the presentation. Let's see here. Come on. Okay, here we go. Hey, I made it back without losing everybody here. So, all right, so that that is probably, we, we stopped using this motor about three years ago, um, but it's in millions of furnaces out there. Um, what we've done on the new furnace is we've gone to a four pin communicating motor. So now instead of that 16 pin port motor, um, we, we're using a four pin port motor here. And, and again, there's I got another video that will explain how to troubleshoot these, but these are even almost a little simpler. So if you take this plug off right here and you look at it, the bottom two pins are ground and 24 volt reference. If I take this pin off of here, and I put 24 volts to these two bottom wires right here, that motor will run. If it runs, it's good. If it doesn't run, it's bad. Okay, so it, we, again, we've got a go, no go test for this new stuff, even though it's communicating. Now, there's other manufacturers that are also using this four pin. I know Carrier does, I think Lennox does. I think everybody's kind of gone to this same thing. Theirs might be slightly different. You may have to check um, with the individual manufacturer um, if it's done a little differently, but that's how ours works. So um, there's some transmit and receive. And again, I'll, I'll play the video and it does a, a much better job of explaining it. So, and again, this um, video is also available on that website. So feel free to go there. Um, it's open to anybody. So let me switch screens here. to the four pin, which is serial port. Yeah, right here, this one, okay. Four wire serial port motor 
uses a digital communication between the air handler, airflow control board, or furnace, IFC, to tell the motor what speed and what CFM we need to deliver. When we get into the diagnostics of the motor, the motor must always have 120 volts on a furnace or 240 volts on an air handler. The next step in diagnostics is to apply 24 volts to the back of the motor. So the very back two pins of the motor is going to be common and red for 24 volts hot. And when the motor has power and receives that 24 volt input, it's going to run at about 75% capacity. The motor does communicate with the control board. But you can see right now the furnace isn't idle. But as soon as I disconnect my communication from the motor and the board, I'm going to get an E17 for an alert. And that tells me I have a blower communication error, in which case I'm going to be looking at my connections. Here it's obvious I disconnected it. It may be a loose connector within the pin, or it may be a broken wire between the motor and the control board. Once I reconnect, it'll recognize the motor communication and go back to the normal idle mode. And this is true of the seventh segment on the air handler and also the IFC on the furnace. Now the connector that I showed in the example can be ordered, and that is publication 34-3454-01. And this harness can be ordered through ComfortSight and DealerNet under the marketing center, then order marketing materials. Now the S furnace, the motor is behind the plate and the control board. So the easiest diagnostics on that is to ensure that I send 24 volts into transmit and ground, which duplicates what the wiring harness does. But here I can simply apply to the harness, so ground will go on the ground terminal for common, and I'll put 24 volts on the transmit, and my motor is going to run at 75% airflow. If my motor runs with a go-no-go -no -go test, I need to continue with the troubleshooting process. If the motor does not energize when it has high voltage applied and 24 volts applied, and I follow the power cycle sequence for at least 60 seconds off, then I know that my motor has failed and I need to order a new motor module. If the motor did run, I'm going to start checking voltages from my control board. The black wire is going to be my ground on this S furnace, so I always want to reference my ground for all test points. And at the bottom connector here is going to be my 12 volt source. So from my meter, I see I have approximately 12.4 volts DC. Now this DC reading is going to vary whether it's a furnace or an air handler because we run a different power supply within the control board. So look for a source voltage someplace between 12 and 14 volts DC, all depending on the unit. And if I see that, I know that I have source voltage that's going to be able to push the communications to my motor. If I do not have the 12 volt source voltage, I know that my control board is at fault and I need to replace the control board. The next element I'm going to check is my transmit to ground. Now this is the individual packets that the motor is sending. So transmit on my control board is gonna to move to receive on my motor. And I can see my TX here is pulsating about once a second. And it's gonna run between 0.7 to one volt DC from what I can read on the meter. If I'm looking at an air handler control board, I'm gonna see the pulse to be much more rapid. And I will see several packets being transferred every second. So the frequency of the pulse is not important, but the fact that we are seeing pulses and voltage confirms that the control board is sending data to the motor. If I have 12 volt source, but I do not see any voltage on my transmit, then I'm going to condemn the board. If I do see pulses on my transmit, I'm going to go to my RX, which is the other white wire just below my ground. And here I can see my RX is very similar to my source voltage, and it is connected to the same power supply. So if my CMI RX does not change in voltage, I know that my motor is not sending any information back to my control board. So here I can see my voltage drop, and that drop of voltage is going to be at about the same pace that I see my transmit. And it confirms that my motor is sending data back to my control board. But for field diagnostics, I'm going to confirm the motor has high voltage. I'm going to apply 24 volts to the motor, and the motor should start up and run. If the motor does run, I will continue the diagnostic to make sure I have 12 volt source DC voltage on the control board. If I do not have 12 volt source, I'm going to replace the control board. If I do have 12 volt source, I'm going to focus on the TX for transmit to make sure the board's sending voltage packets to the motor. If I see the pulsation, I'm going to move to the RX circuit and I'm going to look for a slight drop in voltage from what I have from the source. Now, if I'm seeing a transmit pulse, but I'm seeing no receive pulse, then I know that I either have a broken wiring harness or my motor has failed. 
I'm going to remove the wiring harness at both ends, home out each one of the individual wires, make sure my pin connectors on each one of the wires is going to be tight on the coalesce plug. And if my wiring harness is good, then I know that my issue is with the motor itself, and I will be replacing the motor. For further information on variable speed motor diagnostics, please visit our e-learning course. And in the course catalog, just type in variable speed motors and get an in-depth course on the variance between ECM motors, whether it's constant torque or variable speed, and also why motors fail. Thank you. So anyway, that's, um, yeah, apologize for the volume on that one. Uh, the, I don't know if they've got to work on that, but that that's the two motors that we're doing on ECM right now. So um, we have the go, no go test for either one of them. Um, and, and, you know, the, in, the instructions are in the, the furnaces for the different ways to test these motors. And um, the guys that sent me their emails, I'll definitely send that out um, to you as soon as we get done here or by tomorrow sometime. So those are the motors we're using on our ECM side of the equipment. So now what we've got, you know, since 2019, we went to these X motors. Um, so we've we've gone to an S9X motor, and the biggest difference is it's a different AFUE and it's a CTM indoor motor. Okay, now the one thing about ECM motors and CTM motors is, it, depending where you guys are located in Wisconsin, they all qualify as an ECM. So if there's any rebates or or um, you know incentives, they do qualify. Both of them do qualify, but. They are slightly different, and we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. So the difference between an ECM and a CTM mainly is an ECM is a true variable. It's got infinite speeds. Uh, CTM motor, in our case, we've got nine speeds available to us, okay? Um, remember when we talked earlier about how static pressure increases and the, the, the blower speed stays the same? Well, if you were to look at a CTM motor or an X13 motor on this particular model, you would notice that a half inch of static, if I needed um, a two and a half ton, I'd have to be on tap number five to get 1137 CFM. That might be closer to a three ton. But what happens on a CTM or an X13 motor is as the static increases, the airflow decreases, okay? So when I go to point seven, now I'm down to 1013. When I go to point nine, I'm down to 890. So these are not constant airflow motors. An ECM is a constant airflow and a CTM is a constant torque. It maintains torque, but it, it, it does tend to, to uh, let the airflow drop off as the static pressure increases. And that's pretty similar to uh, in the old PSC motors. As the static pressure uh, increased, the, the airflow dropped off. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind when, when you're looking at these different furnaces when you're doing sales, there are there are differences. They're not uh, apples for apples. So, you know, just, just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, the other thing that happens if you were to look at that same motor, now at a half inch of static at 1100 CFM, I'm using 271 watts, is that one on there? Yeah, okay, 271 watts of power, okay? So at a point seven, I go to 1,021, I go to 290. Uh, at a point nine, I go to 941 for airflow and I, I'm up to 309 watts. So again, as the static pressure goes up, the, the watt consumption goes up, but the airflow drops off. So that's probably the biggest difference uh, between the X motors or the CTM motors and the ECM motors is that that characteristic of the motor. Okay, they wire a little differently. This is this is our um, how our units are wired, and this is the plug. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on the plug, but um, you've got five different wires going into this motor. Actually, you've got six. You've got the common plus the five wires. And what we do is we 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 do DC volts into this a little differently to maintain to try to get the nine speeds and and uh, I guess this next slide will kind of show you how we do that. So when we first came out with these furnaces, what we do and I, I'll show you another version of CTM also because I'm not sure how how everybody's doing it, but what we've got is this five pin connector. Okay, so blue is our common wire. 
and there's tab one, two, three, four, five right there. Um, and if you were to pull this plug off of the furnace and put 24 volts to common in any one of these speeds, that motor should run. Um, but what we're doing is we're giving it DC signals um, and the motor will run according to those DC signals. The reason we've done that is we've switched to a nine tap motor now. And that's maybe kind of misleading. It's still a five tap motor, but we're using nine speeds. So we go tap one through five and then tap six is a combination of one and two. Tap seven is a combination of one and three. Um, tap eight is a combination of one and four and tap nine is one and five. And again, if you look at the motor, we still got our high voltage power on this side and we've got our low voltage power on this side. So we, we still feed the motor continuously and then we send these signals in to change the speeds in the motor. Okay, and I've got, again, I've got a video that will, that will do a good job of explaining that. But by combining some of these voltages, we can make the motor do different things that, that we want it to do. Now, one of the other things is if you look at our rooftops on a CTM motor, you're going to see this. You're going to see your common and your line. Okay, so on a rooftop, this is going to be 208 or 230 or maybe even 460. Um, and then tap one, two, three, four, five is we put 24 volts on tap one, it runs at low speed. We put 24 volts on tap two, it runs at the next speed. Again, three, four, five. Um, the nice thing with CTM motors is we do not have to take tap one power away. So if we're given tap one power and we add 24 volts to tap three, it will ignore tap one and automatically speed up to tap three and just operate. So on, on a lot of air handlers rooftops, you'll see this kind of configuration for the taps. Um, on our furnaces, it's all done through the user interface. So what we do is we get into the motor setup. And again, I'm going to play the video for that and how we do that. And then I've also got a troubleshooting video. Um, but on the furnaces, it's done through the board. So we, had, we electronically change the tap speed rather than physically moving a wire. And, and again, I'll explain or we'll show you how that, that works. Um, and as a matter of fact, I think that's yeah, this video right here. So this is how we do the setup on our taps. And um, let me switch over here to furnace configuration. And again, this is on the website, uh, fieldtechhelp.com. And I'm not going to play the first three minutes because that's other stuff. I'm just going to play the actual blower setup on this one. So. And at this point in time, it is set to tap one only. So tap one is going to give me the lowest airflow, which is the most efficient blower operation and the best air filtration for indoor air quality across the filter. The next configuration down will be airflow. And this is used to set first stage and second stage. So if I have a two stage outdoor unit, I'll need to set the airflow for first and second stage. If it's only a single stage outdoor unit, then I just need to set that high stage airflow. So let's look at the airflow performance chart. And this is for a 60,000 BTU furnace. And let's assume I have a three ton, two stage outdoor unit, and I wanna move nominal 1200 CFM on high stage and about 75% of that airflow on first stage, which will be 900 CFM. Now realize, this is typical nominal 400 CFM per ton. And in most situations, it's not the ideal configuration. Lower airflow will provide better dehumidification lower blower watts, and greater system efficiency. So always reference the ARI ratings, where we rated the airflow, and also evaluate the home on what we need for sensible and latent capacities. 400 CFM per ton is rarely used in the field anymore. So in looking at this table, the first configuration I'll get to, that we'll see in a few moments, will be first stage airflow. And let's assume that at first stage airflow, we want 900 CFM, and I will start on tap three. And now we know when we get a call for Y and G at the furnace, the control board will select tap three, and we're going to move 900 CFM at that 0.5 stand. But now we need to focus on second stage airflow. And as airflow increases, so will static. And there is a definite relationship between the two. So if I want to move about 1200 CFM, my external static will increase to about 0.9. So when you're doing the airflow test, you must have a manometer on the furnace. And the supply probe must be between the heat exchanger and the air conditioning coil. 
and the return must be as close to the blower as possible. So if we have a filter at the base of the furnace, we want that return probe to be between the blower and the filter. And that will provide the reading for the external pressure that that blower is working against. So we select second stage cooling operation. We want 1200 CFM. And as we see the blower increase, our static pressure increases and it'll actually reach about 0.9. So a 0.9 static, I can see that I'm someplace between tap eight and tap nine to achieve that 1200 CFM. So for this example, we'll select tap eight, which will be about 1148 CFM. And then I hit menu to lock that in place. And I know that I have set first stage and second stage airflow. And this will apply to cooling operation as well as heat pump heating. Now for furnace operation, I wanna use these tables as well. And I wanna set my first stage and second stage heating airflow based on static pressure. And the nice thing about furnace operation, there are also performance charts for temperature rise. So once I've locked in my speed tab, I can go ahead and fire the furnace in first stage and second stage operation and ensure my temperature rise is where I want it to be within the performance charts of the furnace. Now, when we're taking airflow measurements, whether static pressure or temperature readings, realize that the readings within the ductwork may vary, especially on the supply side where we tend to have more turbulence. And every duct system will be a little bit different. Taking multiple readings can be beneficial, and I'll try to grab an average between all those readings. So going back to my seven segment display, all right, that's that's pretty much for the the uh, the air setup on those. And I guess the biggest thing I wanted to point out there was, um, you know, we're looking at setting up the taps, and and the tap on that could be you know C one dot four, which is cooling first stage tap four, or cooling second stage tap tap nine. Uh, so it'd be C2.9, uh, so that these cooling second stage tap nine. It's a little bit different, um, and that's kind of specific to our equipment, but it just shows you that, um, you know, we do have to pay attention to um, the airflow and, and again, the characteristics of that motor. So uh, let's see what we got here. All right. Um, and again, on the on the uh, the boards, it's done through the menu and the option to do the setup on these, and and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But um, the basic thing I want to get across here is that CTM motors do operate differently. You know, we've got the opportunity to set it up through our, um, you know, our, our display on the on the furnaces and on rooftops and air handlers. It's usually done through just physically moving wires to change that speed, and that's basically what happens. We talked about the, the airflow, um, how the static pressure increases, the airflow decreases, um, whereas on an ECM, the airflow stays the same as the static pressure increases. Uh, again, CTM or X13 is there for constant torque. Now, the one thing about CTM motors, they're also three-phase motors. Uh, they do come apart. There's electronics on the end of them. We, we don't sell them that way. They sell, they sell as a complete unit, but it's basically the same thing. It's got a simplified version of electronics in the end cap um, that drive a three-phase motor, a three-phase variable speed motor. So basically the same thing as on the ECM. All right, so the last thing I want to get into here, we got about just about that much time is um, how to troubleshoot the nine tap motor, how to, how to check whether it's working properly or not. Okay. So let me grab the last one I've got here and we'll play that and then finish up. Play, here we go. By the way, before if you guys can hear me or not, but um, the, this video applies to the 90%, the 80%. It applies to all CTM motors. Um, the other thing I didn't mention about CTM motors is that we can, because of the CTM motor capability, we can actually run two-stage cooling equipment even on single-stage furnaces um, because of their capability. So that's also something to keep in the back of your mind. It's going to evaluate the troubleshooting process on that nine tap motor used on the X series, the S8 and S9 X series constant torque motor.
solar furnaces. We are now using DC voltage to apply voltage to multiple taps at the same time to obtain additional speed options. And we can utilize the troubleshooting flow chart within the service facts to help with the diagnostics to see if the motor is working like it should. Now this video just focuses on troubleshooting. Is the motor actually running? If you're looking at setting up specific speed torque taps to obtain a certain airflow, then reference our field tech help video on the S8X furnace configuration. And it'll show how to set up airflow torque taps based on the static that blower is working against. So with any ECM troubleshooting, whether it's true variable speed or this constant torque, we want to ensure that we have high voltage feeding that motor. 115 volts on a furnace, 230 volts on an air gun. Now, as I'm watching my meter here, without my leads attached to anything, I can see my meter is bouncing between 120 and 150 volts. And that looks a little perplexing since I'm not attached to any wire. But as I zoom in on the meter, I can see that the auto range selection is on and I'm actually reading millivolts. And this can be very confusing to some of us in the field where we think we have voltage when in reality we do not. So always focus in on the auto steel and see what range we're really reading. Am I reading voltage or am I reading millivolts? And as soon as I hook my meter leads up to L1 and neutral, I can see that meter change from millivolt reading to about that 120 volt input voltage I'm looking for. Now, when I look at the service facts and the troubleshooting flow chart, it's gonna tell me to jump 24 volts to the taps. So for here, I put an amp probe on my L1 line to make sure that my motor is running, in which case I can hear it and I can see it consuming power. So as I apply common to the common pin, and I apply 24 volts to tap one, I move it to tap two, and I can see my amps increase with each speed tap. So this helps confirm the programming is looking pretty decent. Each speed tap or torque tap is consuming a little bit more power consumption, and I know and can hear the blower is running on each one of those torque taps. So from a motor perspective, this go, no-go test with 24 volts on each pin, I can see that taps one, two, three, four, and five are allowing the motor to run. So now I know that my motor is electrically and mechanically sound on all speed taps. So if I have an issue the blower running in normal operation, I can now look at the voltages and the service facts. And from here, I ran constant airflow, just a tap to run the fan only, and I can see between tap one and common running about eight volts DC. So I'm no longer that 24 volt input that I'm used to. I'm now actually on a DC scale, which I have to move my meter to that position. So I take it from a fan only call and I transition to a cooling call. And here I can see cooling stage one and I'm on torque tap number six. Tap one, I should have about eight volts DC. And on tap two, I should have about eight volts DC. And here my meter confirms I have the appropriate voltage. So if my motor is not running in this condition, and since I've already done the 24 volt go no go test, I know that my wiring harness connections are solid on each tap between the harness and the motor itself. So if my board's sending out the voltage and my harness is intact, then I know my issue is going to be the motor itself. Now, if my control board is not sending out the appropriate voltage, then I know my IFC is to blame. The only thing I want to do is to ensure what torque tap is my IFC showing and make sure that my voltage is representative of that particular tap when I look at the service facts. So in this example, if I torque tap seven, I can see that on pin one, I still have about eight volts DC. On pin two, now I have zero volts DC. Wire number two is no longer used for this torque tap seven speed option. And tap three actually has a higher voltage of 18 volts DC. So again, I confirmed that my board is sending out the appropriate voltage on the appropriate taps, and that motor should be running at that torque tap. So in summary, when troubleshooting a constant torque motor on the S-series furnace, the first and most important element is to ensure the furnace receives the proper signal for the stage of operation. So if you walk up to a system that is calling for cooling capacity and the furnace only says COF for constant airflow, that G call, you know that someone has not connected the yellow wire to the Y tap on the furnace. 
So the furnace needs the correct inputs. And this can be validated either by checking 24 volts between yellow and common at the furnace to ensure you have voltage, or you just look at that seven segment display. So if I'm in cooling operation, heating operation, or constant airflow, my seven segment display will tell me what mode of operation I'm in. Not only the mode of operation, but also the torque tap that is associated with that mode. So with troubleshooting, make sure I have the appropriate call to the furnace. I can use a simple go, no go test where I apply 24 volts to each one of the speed taps and common to common and ensure the motor runs at each one of those taps. And finally, with the call for capacity, ensure I'm on the right torque tap and check the service facts for what voltage I should have between the different pins for that specific tap. And if the board is sending the voltage and the motor ran with the go, no go test, you know the focus is on the motor itself. If the board is not sending out the voltage, then you know you have to replace the IMC. All right. Um, we covered a lot of stuff. We're just about at the hour. Any questions at all, you can you can text or you can do them in chat or unmute if you guys want to ask me any questions. Uh, one of the things I do want to say is that <clears throat> when you're dealing with the furnace, is typically an ECM motor. Um, the newer ones, the communicating motors, when the motor goes bad, you can't make the furnace run. The, the furnace board is looking for that communication. Um, the nice thing with the CTM or the X13 motors is you can unplug the motor. The rest of the furnace will continue to run. So if you're in a pinch, you want to throw just a, a rescue motor in there overnight to get some air moving, you can usually do that on the CTM setup and the board won't even know the difference. Um, the only other thing I would recommend, highly recommend, is if you guys don't have needle points for your meters for getting some of these smaller plugs, um, especially if you're doing Mitsubishi equipment, that's a, a really good investment, can save you an awful lot of time. But uh, uh, I guess that's all I've got. If you guys don't have any questions, I appreciate your time. Hope you got some good stuff out of this. And the people that sent me their email addresses will definitely shoot those, those books out for you. So uh, if you need to get a hold of me, you guys know where to get a hold of me. Other than that, have a good evening.